Hello and good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineer for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you this month's installment of E4C's Off-Grid Energy webinar series, focusing on Design of Off-Grid Systems Part 2, System Design. My name is Mariela Machado, and I am Program Manager here at Engineer for Change. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. The, webinars you're, the webinar you're participating in today will be archived on our webinars page and our YouTube channel. Both of those URLs are listed on this slide that you're seeing right now on the screen. Information on upcoming webinars is available on our webinars page. E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming webinars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinar series team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org, as you see on the slide. If you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our hashtag at E4C webinars. Before we move on to our presenter, I would like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and so social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, lack of uh, connectivity, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more that you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to ser serve you resources aligned to your interests. For more information, please visit our website www.engineeringforchange.org to learn more and sign up and become a member. It's free and it will take you around two minutes, so be sure to do that. Today's webinar is the final in the Off-Grid Energy webinar series, as you can see on this slide. Additional topics covered in the series are drawn from the book Battery Fundamentals of Off-Grid Electrification, authored by our presenter, Dr. Henry Louis. The past webinars in this series are listed on this slide and can be found on our website under Professional Development and Webinars. So be sure to check that out if you missed the past webinars. For reference, you can find examples of off-grid energy products like the Mobisol Solar Home System, system like as you see on the slide, in the E4C Solutions Library. There, you can learn more about technical performance, compliance with standards, academic research, and user provision models of these systems. All the information is sourced by E4C research fellows and reviewed by our community of exper experts. It's available for free to our E4C members, so be, be sure again to sign up. You can find the Solutions Library under Learn and Solutions Library on our website. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's practice using the WebEx platform by telling us where, you're joined, where you are in the world. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your, screen, of your screen, please type your location. If the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slide. You can use this window to share remarks during the webinar, and if you have any technical questions, just send a private chat to Engineer for Change admin. So let's take a moment now and do that. Type your location on the chat window right now. So I'm seeing Chennai, Colorado, Dallas, Denver, Arizona, 
Milwaukee, Palestine, Italy, Spain, the Emirates, Czech Republic, South Africa, Alabama, wow, from all over the world, welcome. We're thrilled to have you here. Uh, so now you know where the chat window is, so be sure to, ta to type any uh, uh, remarks, comments that you may have during the webinar in this window. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is located right below, uh, to type in your questions for the presenter. Again, if you don't see it, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. Very important to note is that we will stop 15 minutes or 10 minutes before the hour, so 11.45 a.m. Eastern, but we will make sure to set aside enough time for the Q&A. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hit and stop and then start. You may also want to try opening WebEx up in a different browser. If you keep having issues, please again contact through the chat window our Engineer for Change admin. If we see web webinars, qualify engineers for one professional development hour. To request your PDH, please follow the instructions on the top of E4C professional development page after the presentation, as seen on the screen. Great, so that's all I had. So let's take a moment now to tell you a bit about our presenter before we get started. Uh, started. Dr. Henry Louis is an associate professor and a Francis Wood Endowment Research Chair in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Seattle University. His research areas include electricity access in developing communities, renewable energy, and appropriate technology. He's the president and co-founder of Kilowatts for Humanity, a nonprofit organization providing electricity access and business, business opportunities in Sub-Saharan Africa. Dr. Louis served as a Fulbright Scholar to Copperbelt University in Kidwe, Zambia. He's recognized as a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE and is an associate editor of the journal Energy for Sustainable Development. He's the author of the book Off-Grid Electrical Systems in Developing Countries, published by Spring, Springer Na Na Nature. Welcome, Henry. Thank you for joining us, and over to you. All right. Uh, I'm just waiting for the ball to get past to me. Yes. There we go. There you go. All right. Thank you. Well, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be back again for our sixth and final webinar on off-grid energy. And today's webinar, we're going to be talking about uh, how we design off-grid electrical systems. So if you haven't been a part of our, our other webinars, again, they're archived. And don't feel like you've... Uh, you won't, you won't be able to follow what we're talking about today. Although we are going to be drawing from some of those concepts, I think there's enough, uh, enough new uh, content here that uh, you'll be able to uh, follow along and, and learn something. So today's webinar, like the others, is based off the book, Off-Grid Electrical Systems in Developing Countries. The book contains more detail than I can get into uh, today or, or any of our previous webinars. It contains um, example problems, homework problems, uh, all of that additional content. You can get it on Amazon through Springer, who is the publisher, and you'll find a bunch of other material on my website, drhenrylouis.com uh, slash book. So today's webinar, we're really going to be focusing on the design and implementation of off-grid systems. And we're really going to focus more on mini-grid systems and, in particular, the design of the uh, energy source and energy storage aspects of that. So the design of the distribution system, uh, we're going to uh, leave for the uh, for the book. So today, what we're going to do is I'm going to step you through the typical life cycle of an off-grid project. Uh, then we're going to go over typical methods that you might use to design off-grid systems, and we'll we'll highlight some of the the component the um, uh, properties that you should uh, be aware of when when you select components. So what I've shown here is a, a typical life cycle of an off-grid system. Now, different organizations are going to have slightly different life cycles depending upon their objectives and goals, but I think this is a fair representation of the steps that one goes through when they deploy an off-grid system like a mini-grid. 
we begin with prospecting and screening. And, and here we are just looking for communities that might be in need and might be a good fit for our, our off-grid system. We will winnow that, that list down to a few communities and we'll go visit them. And that's the site assessment step. Based on the data that we've, we've gathered from that site assessment, we'll make some sort of decision on which community or communities to install the system in. And then we move on to the technical and commercial design, which happens uh, more or less simultaneously in, in an iterative fashion. And that's going to be really the emphasis of today's webinar. We then move into the pre-implementation stage, followed by actually installing the off-grid system. And then we move into the ongoing operation. And then finally, we might decide to expand our system or, uh, or retire it. So we're going to step through each one of these in uh, greater detail. So a, a valid question is, you know, which community should I look to implement the off-grid system in? In many regions, there could be hundreds or thousands or even more uh, communities that really need access to electricity. You could, you know, literally throw a dart at a map and any community that that, that dart hit could, uh, could use uh, an intervention. So which one should you choose? And we also note that the success of that that off-grid system, no matter how you define it, really depends upon the location. So sometimes your off-grid system will thrive in one location, but it won't thrive if you had installed it uh, in another. So the task at hand then is to quickly and inexpensively screen uh, a whole host of potential communities. And fortunately, there are some online tools that uh, exist today, and there are more that are, are coming out uh, each year that let you do some screening. So this is the electrification pathways tool that is a, a neat tool. It lets you visualize the communities and screen uh, them based upon like distance from the grid, uh, the available, availability of different energy resources and, and other demographics. And many of these tools will also give you a basic calculation of uh, you know, maybe the, level, the cost of serving energy uh, to that community with various technologies. So it lets you give an idea of, of where you might be targeting these communities. And based upon other factors, like maybe the location of your organization's office, or maybe contacts that you have in the country, or even language considerations, uh, you'll, you'll uh, reduce the list uh, even fur uh, further. The next step is site assessment. And so you can't rely on on you know, national level demographic data to really select a, a community and feel sure about it. You actually need to go and visit it. And so you'll send a small team uh, to visit the, the site. And uh, what you're really trying to do is you know, get a sense of that community firsthand. You'll probably meet with some officials, maybe some of the traditional leadership as well as the, uh, the government uh, leaders. You wanna also make sure that the data you, you saw in your screening tool is in fact, true and, and believable. So you need to set your, your own eyes on it. And a typical activity that also happens during the site assessment is doing surveys and focus groups to get a sense for the community, to get a sense of the electricity uh, demand and so forth. You might recall from our last webinar uh, that we, we discussed using surveys to estimate energy production and, and how that is sort of a, a, a challenging thing to do. You also begin collecting some information on the potential energy resources there that you might power your off-grid system with. So you might look for hydro resources, you might start taking wind measurements, uh, and then you might be looking for locations for, the, for those assets. So you're kind of collecting information that will let you begin a, a preliminary uh, design. After you've gathered data from the communities, you need to make a decision. And that decision can be which community uh, you're, you're going to work with or maybe a you know, prioritization of those communities. Uh, there's several different approaches that you might use to decide which community to have your off-grid system in. Uh, some of the more common ones I have listed here, but basically you wanna take a holistic uh, accounting of that community. You shouldn't just lean on one aspect like their ability to pay uh, for, for electricity. Now, depending on your organization, you might have other objectives like uh, looking for health clinics or schools that you could also provide electricity to uh, if that's the, the mission of your organization. So again, it's really critical that you do this data gathering, uh, that you uh, have a good sense of what you're going to be getting into. In addition, you need to make sure that the community is, 
is of need uh, in need of this intervention, and that um, they, they would they would welcome it. So some of the characteristics that you might be looking for are uh, shown here, and I'm sure the list goes on and on. Uh, but you're looking for things like competition. You know, will the grid get extended to this community soon, or, or will there be another, another off-grid system installed? You want to look for that demand for electricity. Make sure that it's going to be uh, used by the, by the the, um, the people, and that there's an ability and willingness to pay if that's if that's uh, what your organization's uh, goal is. You, there needs to be energy resources. Uh, and then other things like the population you want to have, uh, usually it's preferred for a denser population so that uh, distribution costs are lower. And there's a few other things that are, you know, maybe more political uh, in, in nature that you need to keep your eye out for. So after you've selected the community or communities that you're going to install your off-grid system in, you begin the design. So you've already invested now time and money in these communities, even though you haven't laid a single conductor or installed a single uh, solar panel, because you've visited them, you've collected data, and so forth. So what you're going to do is you're going to do the technical and commercial design, and these are usually going to be uh, in an iterative fashion, and they are interrelated with each other, as we'll see um, a little bit later today. And so. What you'll do is you'll come up with whatever targets are meaningful for you and your organization. This could be you know, the capital expense of the design, the operating expense. It could be um, the access tier that you're able to provide. You might have certain targets that you uh, want to do uh, in terms of energy reliability and quality and so forth. Or you might have other metrics like the average revenue per user. But you uh, will iterate on your design until you come up with one that meets your targets, and if you are able to come up with a design that, that um, meets your targets for that community, then you would consider the next community on your list and sort of continue down until you find one that does work. Then we move into the pre-implementation phase. So here you might be doing tasks like seeking permitting. You might be in identifying vendors that will actually install the grid or, inst or provide you with the components, and you'll work through the contracting. This is really important, if, especially if you are a, a smaller you know, uh, organization that does work abroad, to have strong local partners. Um, I, I think that really you should be working with local suppliers, local installers whenever possible. It supports capacity building, it supports the local economy, um, and it prevents sort of reverse outsourcing of bringing, um, for example, uh, you know, American volunteers to, uh, to a developing country to uh, put uh, people out of work there. So uh, really rely on local talent if, if at all possible. Procurement, you need to have a long lead time on, especially if you're going to be importing um, components. Uh, this can take months. There's a lot of uncertainty. You might have to pay tariffs. So some organizations, like, like my own, Kilowatts for Humanity, um, we, we don't accept donated equipment for several reasons, but one, it, it's more work than it's worth just trying to get it in country. And other things you might do is uh, you, you might be meeting with the community to identify customers, to uh, sensitize them to the, the system that's going to be installed so they have, um, they have an awareness, they have buy-in, and they really understand uh, what will be happening. Then you move into the, Apple, the actual implementation. So here you're actually constructing the system. Uh, you're constructing, you're installing the solar panels perhaps, the distribution system, you're wiring homes. And this can actually go uh, relatively quickly, in some cases just a few days. And then really you want to make sure that you verify and commission the system. So you, you want to make sure that uh, it performs properly, that if you hired a vendor to install something that they did it to, to your spec and that you don't pay them until uh, any, um, every, every last issue is uh, resolved. And then the fun part. So after it's installed, uh, the system is up and running. Here you're serving users. You're making sure that you are uh, maintenance is being done and, and uh, equipment's being repaired and replaced. And then also importantly, you should be collecting data. You should be collecting technical data about how the system is performing, about the electricity that people are using, about their ability to pay, and about how that grid is really impacting the, the community. All of these uh, sets of data are really important, uh, and they're really important to share with, with others. I, I, 
I want uh, one of my my visions for this whole space is that uh, the practitioners, be it for profit or non profit or governmental, really share their experiences and share their data. That's how we'll all become uh, better and and deploy systems that are are more uh, capable of, of doing uh, good good work. So you'll be collecting data, you'll be analyzing it, and that will help you be uh, more effective uh, in your next project. And then at some point you might decide that the demand is sufficient to expand your grid. And this doesn't necessarily mean adding customers. It could be improving the quality of service to the customers or the users that you have by improving the electricity access care. So maybe you increase the availability of the energy. Now in some cases you'll actually have to retire the grid. Maybe the targets that you thought the grid would meet uh, aren't meeting it. Maybe it's not having the impact that you thought and there's another community that would be better served by the equipment. Um, additionally, maybe you have the grid finally makes it to that community. So retirement doesn't have to necessarily be a bad thing. When you retire a grid, you really should restore the, the land and the environment to its original state, to, to how you found it, if not better. Uh, the equipment shouldn't just be abandoned there, especially lead acid batteries. They should be disposed of in a proper and responsible way. And then there might be community relations that need to be repaired. Uh, it really depends on, on uh, how you enter the community and, and what they uh, under, understand the project, what's going to, to be about. So that's the, the life cycle of the mini grid. Um, and I'm going to add one, one final note here. And that's when you do site assessments, when you, when you are involved in that community, uh, one, one rule my organization always follows is to, to never, never promise anything. Uh, you can get communities really excited about an off-grid system, but really you're not ready to commit when you've visited a community for the first time. And so uh, you can create a lot of problems down the road if, if people come and they expect you to give them free electricity and everyone gets the TV. And that's, that's sort of how the project will be um, perceived to be like. So just make, make sure that the expectations are set early and, and repeat that message of what the, the system would be should it be installed, but, but don't guarantee it unless you're uh, able to, to, to follow up on that guarantee. So the remainder of the, the webinar is going to focus on the, the technical design of off-grid systems. So that's step number four. I think one of the most important things to keep in mind is that there's this cost versus reliability curve. And as, as engineers, we usually want things to be highly reliable but we should never forget that there's a cost associated with that. So our goal then is to strike a reasonable balance between the cost of the system and its reliability. So it might cost, for example, twice as much to improve the reliability from 97% to 99%. Um, and that might seem like uh, good from an engineering standpoint, but you have to remember you could have served two communities for that same price. So would you rather have two communities with 97% reliability served or a single community with 99%? Most organizations, or I should say at least many organizations, target about a 95% uh, reliability or availability of the system. So they understand that maybe sometimes during the rainy season uh, the, the system will, will simply not have enough energy to supply their users, uh, but the trade-off there is that the system is, is less expensive and therefore they can install more of those systems. So this is really important, that curve is really important to, to understand. So one of the first steps that you do in designing a system is to understand which energy conversion technologies are available or would make sense. And uh, from a previous webinar, we, we understood that really we're going to use solar, wind, gen sets or micro hydro, those are really the, the only games in town for off-grid electrification. And you're going to look at the availability of those resources, the underlying resources, the cost, their lifespan, maintenance requirements, and several other uh, factors that I have listed here. And, and what, your really goal, what your goal is is to understand which of these are viable and which should you uh, not consider further. Now, the typical de design process uh, looks like this. So the main inputs are going to be the, the demand of electricity, so hopefully something like an hourly profile of, of your best estimate of what the consumption will be, and an estimate of the energy resource. And you take those two inputs, 
and again, that those are just the main endpoints. Inputs or several others, uh, perhaps, and you uh, will apply one of two types of design approaches, either numerical or intuitive, and then your output are going to be the the ratings of the major components like the, the solar panels, the, the batteries, um, and you'll leave the design of, of wires and fuses and, and control systems uh, to a later time when when you've finalized the design of the macro components. So the two design approaches can be described as being either intuitive or, or numerical. And in an intuitive approach, what you're doing is you're following a recipe, more or less. So you're consulting a, a established standard or guideline, or maybe your organization has a rule of thumb that they follow. And you take your inputs, and you make some estimates on some parameters, and you end up with the sizes of your components. So it's an open loop process. You don't gain insight into how the system is going to perform in terms of reliability. You simply adjust some parameters and you end up with a uh, design. The numerical approach is more high tech. Uh, here it's a, a computer aided design approach and it's usually done through a simulation that uh, underlines that, that computer aided design. So we're going to talk first about numerical design. So here what you do is you you uh, usually purchase a, a program. I think there might be some free ones that are out there, but a lot of the ones uh, are for purchase. And so you have a designer, there's a human in the loop here, and they're going to describe the technical environment uh, that, and the economic environment in which that off-grid system is going to live. So they're going to describe things like the, uh, the amount of sunlight or the flow rate of the hydro resource, the different costs of the fuels, and they're going to specify a design, an architecture the size of batteries. And they're going to rely on the computer program then to simulate that design under those external conditions that the designer specifies. And it's often like an hourly simulation over the course of uh, one year or it could be a 20-year simulation. And the output is going to be the, how that system performed in a technical sense and usually also an economic sense. And it can provide some summary statistics uh, as well. So the important thing to note here is that these programs do not design the system for you. You need to have that human in the loop to propose a design to describe the operating environment and the design program just tells you how a particular design would perform. So then the human might look at those results and decide that they're acceptable or not acceptable according to their organization's criteria and if they're not acceptable, they'll propose a different design, or in fact, they might automate it where they're actually simulating hundreds or even thousands of designs to tease out that cost versus reliability curve before ultimately selecting the design that they're going to use. So numerical design is really useful if you have a complex system, a hybrid system, for example, with wind and solar. Um, but the, the thing to note about it is that the input data requirements are high. You have to have a really good idea of the, the load profile, of how that might change throughout the day, how that might change throughout the year. You need to have an understanding of the wind resource, for example. And so the results then are really only as good as the input information. And so just because you're using a computer doesn't mean the results are reliable. So in other words, if you feed it garbage, you're going to get garbage out. If you're making wild guesses on the load profile, if you're making wild guesses on the sunlight or the behavior of, of the wind, your results really aren't going to be reliable. So my organization, we use a, a, a numerical uh, approach as, uh, as a good starting point. So we know that there's going to be some um, uncertainty in how it will actually perform but it's a convenient way for, for coming up with that first, uh, first design. So we use a program called Homer, and it lets you, you know, specify the system architecture easily. It lets you input uh, the, the, the different resources that you might be powering your mini grid with, and it, it provides the results of the simulation in a, in a nice form. Um, and then it also lets you simulate lots of different configurations, possible configurations, and visualize the results and select the best one. Now, full disclosure, uh, Homer does uh, support uh, my uh, nonprofit organization with uh, uh, in-kind support, so I just want to make that, that clear. But still, it's, it's a good example of, 
a, a numerical design approach. Now, intuitive design is um, when you again when you follow a standard, a guideline, or um, or a, a, a really a recipe for designing your off-grid system. And there are several standards that you could uh, consult. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a intuitive design example for a hypothetical community. And I'm not proposing that the intuitive design recipe that I'm going to present is optimized in any way. I simply want to show you the steps that you might follow and the thought process, because it really illustrates what you have to consider in uh, doing your off-grid system design. So, so please don't, uh, don't think just because you're, uh, you saw this on a webinar that this is the gold standard for design. I'm using it for illustrative purposes. I'm also only going to look at the design of, of solar array and a battery. There's other components like charge controllers, uh, inverters that you need to specify and, and design. And those are covered in the book, but I'm not going to cover them uh, today. So we'll uh, do a hypothetical design for a hypothetical community called Mawasi. And this community is far from the electric grid. It's going to be too expensive to bring the power lines to it. Mawasi is uh, hard to get to for uh, several months during the year. And there's no wind, microhydro, or biomass resources available. So really, we're looking at solar as our main energy source. Uh, a genset could possibly be used, but we're worried that we're going to have trouble refueling it during the rainy season. So we've decided to use solar based upon that, uh, as well as the fact that it's in a, a place with lots of sunlight. And so our design uh, horizon is going, going to be five years. And so we're going to look at the system um, not only at installation, but five years down the road and make sure that uh, our system is adequate to serve the community as it grows over five years. So we'll assume that we did a, uh, a survey and we came up with an estimated low profile. And again, we expect there to be a lot of uncertainty around that. Uh, one of the things that we've estimated is that there's going to be a 5% growth per year. So what you see on this table then is uh, the, the values that we expect the load to be like when we uh, launch or when we install the grid, and then after five years. So again, these are these are just estimates, and so we're going to have to account for some of some of that uncertainty in our design because we know that uh, these most likely aren't going to be the exact values that we encounter. So we start with our load estimation. Then we have to come up with our architecture, and we know that the the, the houses and businesses that we're going to serve. They want AC connections, uh, and so we're going to have to supply AC from our, our PV system, which means that we need an inverter there. We also know that we're going to need a, a battery because people are going to want to consume power in the evening when the solar array is not producing. And then we know that our PV array is going to be large enough that we need to have a charge controller with that maximum power point tracking capability. So this is the, the overall architecture of our system, and, and that's a good starting point then for our design. The first thing that we're going to look at is the battery bank. And using this intuitive method uh, for simplicity, we actually can design the battery bank entirely independent of the energy source. So we basically operate under the, the assumption, at least in terms of design, that the battery bank is supplying the load um, entirely and that uh, we're not accounting for the production of the energy system um, when we design the battery. So the main factors that we're interested in then is the DC bus voltage, so what vol voltage should the battery bank be, the average daily load that the battery might have to supply, the discharge current, and uh, the, the required reliability. So we'll, we'll address those in the upcoming slide. So the first thing you look at is the selection of the, the battery uh, voltage. This is also the DC bus voltage. And we're going to use a typical rule of thumb that says the more energy the, the, the battery is expected to supply, the higher voltage you want it to be. And so this is just a rule of thumb guideline. And we know that after five years, Mawasi will be uh, consuming about 10 kilowatt hours a day. And so we're going to select a 48 volt system for our, the DC side of our bus. We next need to consider the average daily load. So this would be the load that the battery would have to supply 
in the absence of any energy production uh, over the average 24-hour period. So we simply take the average daily load, divide it by the battery voltage, and then divide it by the inverter efficiency. Because remember, we're on the, the DC side of the inverter. The load has been estimated on the AC side, so we have to account for the uh, efficiency of the inverter. And so we'll estimate that efficiency to be 85%. And so our final value then for the average load that the battery has to supply each day is 246.25 amp hours. Again, this is at 48 volts. So that's the energy the battery needs for a single day. Um, we need to account for days in which maybe the load is higher or maybe uh, the energy production system is going to be down for perhaps several days. So we, we describe the reliability that we want the battery to be able to provide as the days of autonomy. So quite simply, the days of autonomy is the number of days that the battery bank can supply the average daily load before de being depleted, assuming that no recharging happens. Okay, so imagine that the PV panels were stolen or, or the charge controller is damaged and we're not able to replenish those batteries. So how long do we want those batteries to last? That's the number of days of autonomy. And so typically we'll pick a value perhaps between two on the low end and 12 if we want this system to be really, really reliable. And we'll note that there's sort of a nonlinear relationship here between autonomy and reliability. Now the other thing to note is that we want our system to be able to provide the days of autonomy even after uh, the, the battery is, is quite old. So uh, remember, we're looking at a five-year horizon. So if we want to provide two days of autonomy, we want our battery, even after the wear and tear that it's undergone for four years and 11 months and 29 days, we still want it to be able to provide two days of autonomy. And we know that batteries degrade over time and with usage. And typically, after, at their end of life, their capacity is maybe 80% of what it could have been uh, when it was brand new. So we want to adjust our required capacity by that end of life uh, rating. So for Mawasi then what we're going to do is we're going to pick a uh, two days of autonomy and an end of life rating of 80%. We're going to assume that after five years the battery capacity is no longer uh, what it was when it was brand new. It's simply 80% of that. And so we get a value of 615.63 uh, amp hours as our requirement. Now, you might recall from our, our webinar on battery fundamentals that you can't, you can't describe the capacity of a battery with a single number. The battery varies based upon the amount of discharge current. And the, more, the, the higher the discharge current, the less capacity, the less charge you're able to get out of that battery. So that means we have to pick a current at which we specify the battery capacity for. And there's two reasonable um, approaches. We can perhaps select the average current supply or the peak. The peak current will, be, uh, will yield a more conservative value, so that's what we're going to select. So to calculate the peak current uh, that the, ba the battery will, will be discharged at, we need to look at the, um, the peak value that the inverter needs to supply, which will also be related to the, the peak load, and account for its efficiency divided by the, the nominal battery voltage. So for Mawasi then, uh, our peak load after five years, we expect it to be 1.94 kilowatts. Uh, we know that there's some uncertainty, so we'll add a design margin of about 20%. And so the peak inverter efficiency is 2.33 kilowatts. Converting that to current on the, the DC side, accounting for the efficiency of the inverter means that will ex be expected at its peak to supply 58 amps. So therefore, our battery capacity then needs to be specified at, at 58 amps. And we can do a little bit of math to figure out what the corresponding hour rate and C rate are. So we could continue to just use 615.63 amp hours as the capacity and, and move on to designing the battery bank connections itself. Uh, but there's a few other things that we probably should consider. And I'll, I'll go over those briefly next. One of the things to consider is that at the end of the, the two days of autonomy, so that worst case scenario where the PV panels aren't producing anything for two days, um, at the end of those two days, do we want the battery to be at a 0% state of charge 
or do we want to have something left uh, in, in that battery, some charge left? And the reason why you don't want the battery to be at 0% state of charge even after that worst case scenario happens is that the battery will might be damaged from that deep discharge. We know that deeply discharging a lead acid battery um, shortens its life. So typically we're gonna leave anywhere from 20% to even in that battery, not for reliability, but to, uh, to improve its health and, and longevity. So then we can actually adjust the, the capacity that we calculated by our, um, our, the, the, the maximum depth of discharge. And so if we're going to let our battery discharge, even during that worst case scenario to 80%, meaning 20% of the battery capacity is left, we will need the battery to be 769.49 uh, amp hours. And the final thing that we need to look at is that daily depth of discharge. We know that the life of a battery uh, depends upon how discharge on a regular basis. So what we want to do is we want to look at the battery, uh, the particular battery that, we're, that we've selected perhaps, and see uh, how, how deep it can be discharged and still last our uh, five years that we're targeting. So for five years, uh, which is 1,825 cycles, the battery cannot be discharged more than 40% each day on average. We can do a calculation based uh, on our average load and our battery capacity and see that we're only discharging at 32% on average a day. So that, therefore we expect our battery to last uh, at least the five years. So that's a good check and uh, we don't need to adjust our design further based upon that. The last thing we do is we apply a design margin and here uh, we're, we're trying to account for any errors in our load, the day-to-day -day variability of load, so the extreme days where our load might be extremely high. We're also accounting for effects of temperature and other losses. So we simply um, scale the battery by a, a design margin. And so in Mawasi, we'll just pick a design margin of 7.5%. Uh, and so we end up with a final battery bank target capacity of 827.21 amp hours when discharged at uh, 58 amps. So importantly, we do the, calc the math here and we uh, come up with an hour rate of 14.25 hours. Again, the, the C rate and hour rate are covered in our webinar on battery fundamentals. So then we need to pick the, the battery itself. And let's assume that we're considering a, a six volt battery. Uh, in real life, you'd be looking at a whole range of batteries, but let's say we've decided we're gonna use a particular battery whose voltage is six. Uh, we'll need at least eight of these batteries to be placed in series in order to, to achieve our 48 volt uh, battery, uh, our DC bus target. So we need at least eight of these batteries. But then we need to look at the capacity of the battery and make sure that it satisfies our design requirement. So like I said before, there's not a single value that describes the capacity of the battery. Rather, you'll encounter a table like the one shown, uh, and it describes how the capacity varies at different hour rates. So we know that we're going to be targeting that 14.25 hour rate, which unfortunately the manufacturer doesn't provide. They provide a 10 hour rate and a 20 hour rate. So we're gonna to have to approximate what it would be at 14.25. And out of convenience, we're gonna pick the nice round value of 200 amp hours, noting that it's somewhere between 190 and 220, um, which correspond to the 10 and the 20 hour rate. So the number of, of strings of batteries then that we need is uh, simply our total capacity requirement divided by the individual battery capacity. Uh, and we, we have to round that up to the, an integer value. So we need five strings then. So our battery design then looks something like this. Uh, we need five strings of eight batteries. Each of them are going to supply about 11 amps, 11 or 12 amps during the peak load. And, um, and this is our first design then of the battery. Uh, bank. The battery bank design that is shown is probably conservative. I'm sure we could tweak it. And in general, we'd want to use larger batteries uh, than, than the 200 amp hour, just so that we have fewer batteries there. We usually try to minimize the number of strings that we have uh, for safety reasons. But nonetheless, this is our first, uh, first approach, or our first design. We then move on to designing the energy source. And the overall thought behind designing the energy source is that it should be large enough to supply the average daily load after we account for all losses in the system. 
and we will design the, the energy source based upon the month with the lowest resource availability. So this typically is either the winter or the rainy season if we're going to use PV, or maybe the dry season if we're going to use microhydro. If we expect our load to be seasonal, then we will pick the month that has the highest load and the lowest resource and design around that worst case scenario. So because we're, we're using a PV array, we know that we can tilt it at different latitudes. So we would consult a, uh, a solar database and come up with the average daily installation. Uh, we talked about this in the last webinar. And we'd pick the tilt that ha whose lowest value is the highest, because uh, that's the worst case uh, scenario for that tilt. And we see tilting it at latitude is the, the, uh, gives us 5.08 kilowatt hours uh, per meter squared per day in the, uh, the worst month. So that's what we're going to, uh, to select. And so we can actually do a calculation and convert the insulation that we expect um, and the, uh, the energy uh, requirement to come up with the size of the battery, or excuse me, the size of the PV array. In this case, we need 2.33 kilowatts to supply that 10.05 kilowatt hours of, of daily energy. Now, it's important to note that we are ignoring losses here. So we need to actually scale this up. And the book goes into this more de in more detail, but we want to account for losses, like those shown on the table on the right. We want to account for the temperature-related losses and then add a design margin. So all of these, in, in sum, then bring our required PV capacity up to almost 5 kilowatts to supply our, um, our system. Uh, we then have to design our, our, syst our, our PV array itself. So here, you're likely going to select the largest uh, panels that you can find, and that's typically around 350 watts. So we get a sense of the number of panels we need just by taking the required capacity and dividing it by the capacity of an individual PV module. And so we know we need at least, 50, uh, excuse me, at least 14 of these. Now, in designing the, the PV array, we need to consider things like the charge controller constraints. Um, and I'm not going to go into that in detail, but the, the book does. But it, it will often limit the number of strings that you have or the number of PV panels that you can place uh, in series. And so we'll assume that, uh, in this case, each charge controller can have no more than 10 PV modules and that the open circuit voltage is, is such that we can't have more than five um, strings per uh, uh, controller or uh, five modules per string uh, per controller. So then this would be our, our first uh, design. There's, of course, several other designs that, feet, that, that meet that uh, condition, but here we have um, the right number of modules, and it actually requires two charge controllers. So I, I walked you through a, an intuitive design, and again, I'm not proposing that this design is optimized in any way, quite far from it. In fact, this just get, gives the designer an idea, uh, a starting point. And what they will do after this is come up with a cost estimate for this design um, and then decide if, if uh, they're selecting the right size batteries. Can they, can, will it be cheaper if they use uh, some that have a larger capacity? Um, they might tweak the days of reliability, uh, day, excuse me, days of autonomy and other parameters, ultimately ending up with, with the final design. So um, that, that's how we do uh, intuitive design. Um, and before I, I leave, um, I just want to uh, mention that, you know, when you do work in, uh, in these at-risk communities, there's quite the potential to do uh, more harm than good. And just as one example, uh, I used to love taking pictures of, of children and, and showing, them what, uh, showing the pictures to them on my cell phone. And it was a really touching moment to do that. Um, but I always thought it was such a fleeting experience and I wanted to give them sort of a keepsake. So I went and got a, um, a Bluetooth connected pocket printer and I could print images on demand. And so the next time I went to this one, one of these communities, I printed a small picture uh, of a group of children, uh, a bunch of boys by, the, by this lake. And after printing it out, um, we decided we'd give it to, to one of the boys who had a particularly bright smile. So I handed the picture to that boy and all the rest of them started beating him up because they were quite jealous. And of course, uh, you know, we stopped it and, and I pulled the picture uh, away. But that's just an example of how good intentions can go, uh, can go wrong. And I actually keep that picture, I'm looking at it right now on my desk as just a reminder of that very fact. 
so what I started to do after that then is I only did family portraits like the one that you see here, and I'd always give the picture to, to the mother of the household. So the other moral of the story here is, is to learn from our, our mistakes. So uh, with that then, I will uh, uh, close uh, my last webinar here in this series. I'm happy to, uh, to answer questions that you uh, might have. So thank you so much for your attention, and I, and I hope you found this whole webinar series uh, valuable, and uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, offline as well. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Henry. As usual, incredible webinar. We have many questions, <laughs> as usual. So I will try to ask a few of them and see where we get. Uh, the first one um, we have here, and we're now open for Q&A. So if you have any questions, you type. But I have over 20, so let's try to go through them. Could you please give us an example, and this is for, for Henry, a, of design programs that allow deterministic simulations of the system? Yeah, I, I think, uh, again, you know, like, uh, for what it's worth, they, they provide in-kind support to my organization. But even before they did that, I used Homer. Um, it's, uh, I think you can have a free trial of it and see if it meets your, organi your, your organization's needs. Need. So it's this Homer Energy, if you do a search for that. Uh, there's actually more activity in this space. Uh, if you look at computer-aided design, I think um, uh, Odyssey Energy, I think that's their name, uh, they, they have some, some computer tools that help. Uh, uh, Ret Screen also does off-grid system design. So there's a few options that are out there, and you'll have to find one that matches you know, what you want as well as uh, what you're willing to pay. So those are, those are just a few, but there there are there are there are there there are several, and more are coming out each day or each month, really. And and there's a follow-up question to this, I guess. Is there another computer simulation program out there that is also very good besides Homer? And I guess you answer that question. Yeah. Well, I will say that uh, some universities have come up with their own um, uh, own design problems or excuse me, design programs. Uh, and those might not be as well supported or have as many features, but uh, there are some universities that uh, that that do have uh, design programs. So if you do enough internet searching, you'll find them. I also have a couple of, of them listed in my uh, in my book as well. Great. This is uh, also a question related to Homer. Why not let Homer to select battery sizes based on hourly load instead of sizing before simulation? Uh, could you repeat that one? Why not let Homer to select battery sizes based on hourly load instead of sizing before simulation? Yeah. Uh, so unfortunately, you know, the you have to let uh, Homer know what what size batteries you want it to simulate, and so you can just pick a, a solution space or, or a bunch of si different sizes of batteries and, th and then let Homer select from that. You absolutely can do that. But you need to have some sort of starting point uh, to, to uh, really make the this, make this simulation a little more effective in finding what works for you. So, um, and, and you don't need to go through, what I went through today uh, at, at the, the latter half of my webinar was not suggesting that you follow this intuitive design and then you uh, use computer-aided simulation. Uh, this would be if you decided not to use com you know, computer-aided simulation, if you wanted to just um, do it, uh, come up with a design sort of on your own. If you were to use a computer-aided simulation, you need to have just a ballpark estimate. Uh, so if I had a ballpark estimate, the, the different uh, sizes of a system, I would start by taking my average daily load and uh, figure out what the PV array would be, assuming maybe four hours of uh, full sun. So if I have a, a, a 12 kilowatt hour per day um, load, I would say, well, I probably need at least three, uh, three kilowatts of PV. I just take the, the 12 and divide it by four. And that would be like my starting point. And it's not going to be the optimal by any sense, but it gives me, you know, an order of magnitude. Um, and then I would, I would estimate the uh, the load based upon, or excuse me, the battery size based upon the voltage level and an idea of the days of autonomy, maybe two or three. And so that would give me a starting point, which I would feed into Homer, and uh, and then I would try a bunch of other sizes around that. 
So uh, Homer has really good documentation, and uh, if if you want to really know how how and and lots of support. So you know if you want to use Homer, uh, they they can walk you through that that whole process. Okay, great. We have another question here: at DC versus AC mini grid. What is the most energy efficient, which is the most cost effective? Yeah, uh, great, great question. So um, it, it depends on the nature of your load. If your load is only going to be DC, then I always recommend, you know, if, if your load is going to be DC and if you're using solar panels, then it would make sense for everything to be DC. Uh, some of the caveats to that, though, are if you, you know, if you're going to have some AC load, uh, even if that AC load ultimately, so it's a computer, for example, ultimately is going to convert it to DC, you're going to have an easier time finding load that is compatible and expecting, you know, uh, 50 hertz AC at 220 volts or whatever the national standard is. It's just more appliances out there that are designed for AC. And so it's going to be easier to get them into the rural communities. You're going to have the economies of scale that kicks in with mass manufacturing. So that, that would be a consideration. Uh, the distance that you're going to have to transmit the, uh, the power also is a consideration. It's easier to get high voltage AC than high voltage DC. Uh, so unfortunately, there's not a, a clear cut answer. It depends on your application. In the case that you're just doing LED lighting and you're using solar, then I think DC makes a lot of sense. But as you move towards higher loads, then I, um, I and a variety of loads, I think AC uh, makes more sense. Okay, excellent. So the next question: What is the best way to decide the coincidence factor to avoid avoid oversight in the system? Any rule of thumb? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> unfortunately, there's not a lot, and we talked about this briefly at the end of the last webinar. Uh, but there's not a lot of data there uh, to, and I maybe there is, but I haven't seen it to, to support a good rule of thumb for coincidence factor. I mean, obviously what you want to do is you want to have an understanding of the users. And if they're all, say, households uh, that are going to use the electricity for lighting in the evening and televisions, then you're, there's, you can expect a lot, a high coincidence in your, um, in your system. So a high coincidence of your load. Maybe not, certainly not 1.0, but you know, you might, it might be like 0.8 or something. Uh, but that also depends on the number of users. So the more users you have, the lower the coincidence will be just due to random variation. So unfortunately, again, it's, it's, there's not a, a clear-cut um, uh, answer. And uh, although if you look at the last webinar, I present a, a graph, and that a graph is based on uh, about like 200 households. Uh, so if your mini grid has fewer than 200, you know, you're going to have lower coincidence than, than what we've picked in, in uh, that example. So I hope that answers your question. It's tricky, and it is something that you need to be aware of. Okay, great. The next question, uh, would you give us rules of thumb, again, <laughs> on integrating okay. different distributed generations, namely when biomass power generations and a battery pack all together into a single mini-grid system? So I will repeat, yeah. will you give us a rule of thumb on integrating different distributed generations, namely when power and battery uh, and a battery pack all together into a single mini grid system? Yeah, um, so my basic rule of thumb is to keep it simple. So uh, if, if you can get by with just solar, then absolutely just use solar. Uh, you shouldn't be doing wind uh, or making uh, hybrid systems just because you fancy them and they sound exciting. Um, so if you have a good solar resource, usually it's best just to stick to that solar resource. However, if you are in a situation where maybe there's a lot of sun um, and it's also quite windy at night, then potentially installing wind turbines would reduce the required size of your batteries. Um, so you have to really know your, your resource profile if you want to do that. Uh, the other thing to consider would be um, the reliability requirements. Uh, and here I think gensets, which could be powered by biomass, I suppose, can make a lot of sense. So if you have, um, you have a high reliability requirement or perhaps there's a few weeks a year where you expect it to be 
the load to be really high or the uh, the resource the sun to be um, really weak because of rainy season. Then having a gen set that you only run a few hours uh, during the, those those uh, extreme scenarios can actually save you a lot of money because you won't need to have a, a large battery bank that largely is unused most of the year. So having a backup gen set makes a lot of sense. They're expensive to run, but they're cheap to purchase. So as long as you don't you don't buy, uh, as long as you don't run them that often, they can complement wind or, or solar um, quite well. So I hope that answers your question. Again, I would strive for simplicity uh, in everything you do. The more complicated you make the system, the harder it's going to be to maintain, the easier it is to make a, a mistake on either the design or operational end. Great. I will follow up on reliability. So we have one question related to this. It was mentioned that systems are designed targeting around 95% reliability. How is reliability calculated or measured in terms of the energy demand that is covered or hours that the system is available? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so um, what, what we're talking about there is the, what we might call the loss of power supply reliability. Um, so it, it, it's simply like the, the number of hours or the percent of hours that you have uh, the, the system available. So, you know, 95 percent, you know, that's one out of 20 hours that you, uh, you aren't available. Um, and that might seem like a lot, but I think in practice, those hours tend to be clumped up uh, together. So maybe it's, uh, you know, a few hours overnight during the rainy season uh, uh, here and there. And again, 95 percent, that is um, uh, not going to work for every organization. I know we design around 95 percent, but we really have much higher reliability than that. Um, and, uh, and a lot of that just goes into our engineering bias to, to oversize things and to make conservative estimates. <laughs> so um, that being said, you, you shouldn't pick and design around you know, 100 percent or 99.99 percent. You're going to end up with a, just a massive system. And you should also make sure, though, that people understand the reliability. Um, fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, you know, the requirement to have their electricity 24-7, 365 uh, days a year, isn't met by the, the national grid either. I mean, their, their outage rates can be quite high, um, and 95% might actually be comparable with that, uh, with the national grid. Great. Okay. Dr. Henry Louis, I really want to thank you. This has been an amazing webinar series. We're out, we're out of time, unfortunately. Uh, but I will end up with one last question and then remind everyone that all the webinars are on our website. Uh, Engineering for Change Admin just posted the link, so be sure to check that out. They have additional questions regarding online courses on the design. Is there any recommendation that you have on online courses on the design of a mini grid integrating different distributed systems uh, like Coursera or Platform? Any that you would recommend? Uh, Enough you know, I, I, I won't be able to recommend a, a single online course. Um, I know that you're seeing more and more of these being, uh, of courses being offered. I'm not, I'm not aware of an online course, uh, a true online course that goes into the design of off-grid systems in the developing community or the developing world context, which I think is important. I'm sure you can find some that, that cover mini-grid design. But that's going to be a very different context. That's probably going to be for, you know, military bases or college campuses or um, situations where you have the need for extremely high reliability and, and you're going to have the latest technology that you're implementing. Uh, what we're doing is something far different. We're usually using, you know, already commercially available systems. Our reliability, reliability requirement isn't as high. There's no grid to connect to. Um, so unfortunately, no, I, I, I won't be able to recommend uh, any, any um, other online source. If you do uh, want more information, though, I, uh, my website, drhenrylouis.com, I'll be posting uh, slides and a bunch of other material over the next few months uh, that are related to, to this book and the course that I teach. And I do know that a few other universities have adopted this book um, and, and are using them. So maybe you can, if you're a student, you can... Uh, go bug a faculty member and have them contact me and, and we can get them set up. Great. Thank you so much, uh, 
it was an absolute pleasure to have this series with you. Uh, this has been super useful, and we have had like so many attendees, and I'm sure you know there will be many more questions. So I leave here on this last slide his contacts. Again, if you go to our website, you will see the whole series. So be sure to check that out. And we thank you so much for attending, and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.